it's very hard if you're going through any kind of periodization scheme to be able to increase your aerobic base as you're trying to get ready for a meet, say eight weeks out, 10 weeks out. If it drops, you're pretty much fucked. It drops, you gotta learn how to use passive recovery and everything you can to be able to recover, to be able to get there. But then once you get past the meet, you need to get that. Get the fuck up. Simon says, get the fuck up. Throw your hands in the sky. Get the fuck up. Question is how to incorporate the sled or prowler type work for for powerlifting and what would be the best way to put it into the program there it's a kind of a difficult question to answer because i don't know how you actually train so let's step back real quick and understand that there's there's different types of periodization schemes or protocols which let's say you got linear periodization block periodization concurrent periodization and then what I just call a fucking disaster, which is, you know, people that don't know what they're doing. Um, and then a higher level of periodization, which I would just call auto-regulated. But if, if somebody's at that point, they're not going to be asking this question because they already know that. So how this falls is going to depend upon how the whole training is set up. With that in mind, I think it plays more a role for recovery and restoration then it's gonna play for conditioning. You know, the, the off-season conditioning for a power lifter isn't gonna be the same as what off-season conditioning or preseason conditioning is gonna be for a football player. It's, it's, it's not the same thing. And most of that conditioning GPP type work for a power lifter is gonna be on, you know, special exercises, hypertrophy work and so forth. The, the best way for a power lifter now, you know, I'm not speaking about fat loss or losing weight. I'm just talking about for a power lifter. I'm not talking about for a straw man either, just power lifter. Would be to use the sled. I personally like the sled a little bit better than the prowler for this because it's lighter for one thing and it's easier to get in and out of the gym and it's going to be uh, less oxidative. You know, I'm not going to be breathing so hard. I want to feel like I'm going to puke. Um, just bending over, pushing the prowler is kind of like doing a mountain climber. And for a, a lighter weight power lifter, that's probably great. But I was always a heavier power lifter and it always became my heart rate was getting too high i like to use the sled and to advise people to use the sled as a warm-up on lower body days just walking with the sled making sure that you're taking deliberate steps and every time you take a step extending your legs so you are stretching your hamstring and then bringing it into the ground so you're just not walking you're trying to deliberately walk and stretch your hamstrings at the same time some of the steps may be a little bit more marching oriented to try to open up the hip flexors a little bit and get the hip moving around a little bit. Forward and backward trips, maybe 20, 30 yards, three or four trips, just to kind of get the blood running, and that's good. On upper body days, taking the sled with the upper body sled straps, maybe a quarter, 45 on it, and just walk forward doing front raises, walk backward doing rear raises just to get the blood flowing in the upper body, the pecs, the shoulders, the back. You want to, you know, as, as a warm up. That's where I see that. On off days, I had a lot of success doing a little bit heavier sled dragging. So in, let's say, actually back then, Louis had what he was calling the empirical rule of 60%. And I would wave that 60% that over a three day period. Um, I don't know if I necessarily need to get into that, but on day one would be the heaviest weight. Day two would be 60% less. Day three would be 60% lighter than that. Day four, I take off and then I would repeat. And that cycle just kept repeating over and over and over and over. Um, and I had a lot of luck with that. Um, where I had the greatest amount of luck, I think, from the sled was on my off days, especially the days using a concurrent program or a Westside program or conjugate program. 
Um, uh, keep in mind that conjugate and, and west side, it's just a form of concurrent training. There's, there's many other forms of con concurrent training. It's a type of periodization. You know, the conjugate is not the, it's, don't get them confused. That's like saying that, you know, if I wrote some linear progressive overload periodization program that that program then becomes all linear programs and that's not necessarily the case. But <clears throat> I predominantly use and liked and had the greatest success with a concurrent program and have used all types of periodization. On the off days, especially after the max effort and the dynamic work days where I was shot. So if you're using a different style of periodization on the days that you wake up and you're just shot and it's more than just your muscles being sore, it's like your fucking bones hurt and everything hurts, your central nervous system feels shot. Sled dragging was a rejuvenator, you know, and that would be a little bit heavier. Um, say twice the weight you would use as the warm up for whatever trips. I mean, you, you, your baseline starting point, start with two, four trips and a trip would be down. So four trips would be down, back, down, back. You can define that however you want, as long as you're consistent with it. Start with something that's fairly easy for you to do and then work up from then. There's no reason to make this an hour long session. 20 minutes is enough. But on those sessions, I would hit uh, forward sled dragging, backward sled dragging, front raises, rear raises, and ankle dragging. And about that time, we get to right around 30 minutes before I was done. Short rest periods, if, if not no rest periods, just enough to kind of change the weight for the next movement that I was gonna do and then back out. That had a tremendous effect on allowing me to be able to recover better. At the same time, I only used that eight to 10 weeks out before I was to compete. If it was any further out than that, I didn't use it because I did not want to become accustomed to that as being a recovery method that I used. I always wanted to have fallback recovery methods as the intensity and the training got harder towards the meet that I could put more in there. The first recovery method I put in was typically the sled work because that's active. The later recovery methods that I put in, which would be steam, sauna, shower, that type of stuff were more passive. Um, just meaning that there's really not a whole lot of movement. You just massages, you just kind of lay there the steam, you walk from one to the other. Um, but I never did them all right from the very beginning. You know, I, I added them in as needed. You know, it's a correlation to that if, if, if you're a bodybuilder, you know, a bodybuilder, will, they, they're not gonna start their diet 16 weeks out taking fat burners and doing a huge amount of cardio and having zero carbs and training seven days a week. You know, they, they keep progressing until the, they need to take and add that next thing in to help them keep lose, to keep losing weight. Strength training and the recovery methods are the same thing. You know, as you're, long as you're recovering and you're getting to work out to work out and everything's becoming stronger and you're not feeling beat up, then you don't need to put it in there. But when you start to feel just a little nick, just a little beat up, then you need to put it in there. Some, some of the biggest mistakes that I made is not putting this shit in when I should have and said, ah, it's not a big deal, fuck that, I'm not gonna do it and, and just kind of blowing it off. And usually every time that I did not do that and I did not add in that next recovery means is usually when I ended up fucking something up. Um, so that's, that's the best way I see putting that in there for powerlifting. The prowler can be used as a sled. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously it's heavier. Um, and for the lighter people, you can get into the prowler pushing, but the pushing's really not, I like to see the hamstrings being engaged more which is why I like the walking. You know, the pushing is more gonna be, you know, quad and, you know, actually just breathing. I mean, especially when you're bending over, but quad and all that other stuff. The other stuff I didn't really like with the pushing of the prowler is, you know, if it's on grass or if it's in pavement and you hit a stone or a rock or something like that, it always kind of fucking tweaked my shoulder. And, it, you know, I, I don't like that. I didn't like the risk associated with that going into a meet. Now, if you want to use the prowler outside of a meet, you know, to do prowler sprints and all that, to try to take your aerobic base higher, and this is a different topic, 
which isn't recovery. It's dealing with your aerobic base. Um, as a power lifter, you still need to maintain a certain aerobic base. And if that falls, you're not going to be able to recover no matter what. So <clears throat> it's very hard if you're going through any kind of periodization scheme to be able to increase your aerobic base as you're trying to get ready for a meet, say eight weeks out, 10 weeks out. If it drops, you're pretty much fucked. It drops and you got to learn how to use passive recovery and everything you can to be able to recover, to be able to get there. But then once you get past the meet, you need to get that aerobic base up to wherever your baseline is to be able to help you recover. Your aerobic base as a power lifter is nowhere near the same as what the aerobic base would be for a gymnast, football player, or whatnot. But if it falls and you need to bring it up quick, the prowler is probably the best way to bring that up quick. It doesn't take very long and you adapt very fast, but the, few, the first couple of weeks are gonna suck. They're gonna suck big time. But from that standpoint, I'd rather have two weeks that suck big time to get it back up to baseline than to have to work on trying to get it back up to baseline over a period of four to six weeks. You know, the best specific thing for a beginner or a novice to do is just something like, Dave, you got like six weeks of glycogen in your system right now. You know, that, so I kind of knew it was going to be a 